Today we've released another update to the GTO Check Solver dashboard. The equity graph has been revamped to conform more closely to the type of equity graph that many are familiar with, which has been implemented in some form in a number of solvers and other tools in the past. This graph plots each hand within both players' ranges, depicting its rank in each player's overall equity distribution. The y-axis shows the equity of each plotted hand, scaled from zero equity at the bottom to 100% equity at the top. And the x-axis shows the percentile strength ranking of such hand from weakest to strongest left to right, based on its relative weight within the distribution. So for example, in this hand, which is from a six max cash game, where the small blind three bet the button, the nuts are pocket eights on this board. So if we isolate just the pocket eights, we see that the equity of this hand is very high and it's at the 100th percentile of the small blinds range. This type of graph can be quite useful to help us understand how EV maximizing strategies are driven in a number of ways. For one, it provides a very clear visualization of the strength of both players' ranges at a glance, which allows us to better assess how overall range compositions affect strategies. So in this case, we see that the ranges are quite symmetrical throughout most of the range, up until around the 70th percentile, which represents hands with around 60% equity or less, the ranges are very similar. It's only when we go above this point that the ranges start to diverge, where for the next 25% or so of the range, the small blind has a clear advantage, likely primarily due to its overpair advantage, and then at the very top of the ranges, the in-position player appears to retake the advantage. However, since this segment represents such a small part of the range, it isn't very easy to make out. So we've added this zoom bar at the bottom, which allows us to hone in on select portions of the equity distribution. To take a closer look, all we have to do is brush in the area we want to focus on, and then this chart will redraw so that the view becomes much more fine-grained. And then we can brush this area where the in-position player has the advantage, which will isolate the specific hands in this region, and now we can very clearly see the basis for the in-position player's advantage. The button's range contains more of the sets because he has fours and deuces, which the small blind is unlikely to have as the pre-flop three better. So the result of this dynamic, where the ranges are symmetrical for most of the range, and the button actually has the advantage with respect to the nuttiest hands, coupled with the fact that the small blind is out of position, results in a significant amount of checking by the small blind, and when the small blind does bet, it primarily uses the smaller quarter pot and half pot sizings. Another way this graph can be quite useful is that it allows users to create very precise buckets based on incremental equity. So for example, let's isolate the small blinds over pairs and then zoom in on this area. And then let's brush the over pairs with the highest equity right at where this break exists. Not surprisingly, these are the strongest over pairs, queens through aces. And we see that these hands are checking around 45% of the time on average. And when they do bet, they're splitting between the quarter pot and half pot sizings. And because the EV regret for all three of these options are relatively low, just randomizing among these actions for this class should generally be fine. Now let's brush the next segment down, which we see is comprised of tens through kings. Although queens and kings were also in the higher tier, we see that the kings and queens in this tier do not contain the spade for the backdoor flush draw. This tier of hands, although checking around the same amount as the higher tier, starts to utilize the larger three-quarter pot sizing, and for the most part, stops using the quarter pot sizing. And then when we zero in on the lowest overpair tier, which is comprised of nines and tens without a spade, we see that the checking drops by more than half, and this class starts utilizing the full pot sizing. So why in the world are the stronger hands betting less often and utilizing smaller sizings, whereas the weaker hands are betting more often and utilizing larger sizings? Well, one of the primary reasons for this is protection. As most of you know, equity objectively measures the likelihood of a hand to win at showdown, assuming both players check down, so hands with higher equity are less likely to be outdrawn on later streets. As such, aces and kings and queens with a spade need relatively less protection and shouldn't mind seeing turns and possibly getting in multiple streets of value to grow the pot. However, there are many turns and rivers that will be terrible for nines and tens, 
So these hands are more incentivized to bet bigger with a higher frequency to try to take the pot down now. Obviously, these tendencies for these hands can easily and quickly be viewed by simply hovering over them in the heat map. However, this information by itself doesn't tell us why the solver is doing what it's doing. And in the GTO check system, we always want to understand the why, because that logic, and not these charts, is ultimately what we will carry with us to use at the felt. And equity will, in many scenarios, play a large role in explaining why the solver is doing what it's doing. Now let's see how these dynamics change when we get to the river after the small blind c bets quarter pot and the button calls, then the small blind checks a six of hearts turn, the button bets 31%, and the small blind calls, and the river is the jack of spades. Now we see that the equity graph looks quite different. The bottom 30th percentile of both players' ranges are comprised of hands with lower than 30% equity. And this group consists of a lot of two overs with hearts that, on the flop, were more likely to stab in the small blind shoes and call with in the button shoes, and which upgraded to a flush draw on the turn. However, after this point, we see that the button has a pretty significant advantage for most of the rest of the range. Around 70% of its range is comprised of hands with around 65% equity or more, whereas around 75% of the big blind range has less than 50% equity. This makes sense since the big blind checked and the button bet the turn, and also because the 6 and jack generally favor the button's 3-bet calling range, as he has a higher proportion of jacks and 6s. The net result of this is that the big blind is doing a lot of checking here, over 90% of its range. Now let's move on to the button's decision facing a check and isolate its top pairs which are mixing between checking and betting. We can then hone in on the equity distribution of this specific class to try to ascertain how incremental equity is impacting the solver's strategies and defining the cutoff point between betting and checking. So first, if we isolate this cluster of combos at the very top of the distribution, we see that these hands are betting essentially 100% of the time, including by shoving over 40% of the time. So what do these hands have in common? Well, they are all top pairs with top kicker, which also contain the ace of spades flush blocker. And then the rest of the top pairs all have around the same equity and are checking on average around 75% of the time, with the hands betting most often being the other ace-jack combos without the spade. So in this node, we see that incremental equity has a reverse impact for our top pairs when compared to its impact on the big blind's over pairs on the flop. On the flop, over pairs with higher equity were playing more passively because they didn't need as much protection as they were more likely to win at showdown, whereas on the river, since there are no more cards to come, the sole focus of incremental equity with respect to the button's top pairs is how far ahead these hands are compared to the big blind's range and whether they can be called by worse. So in this quick video, we showed just a few examples of how the new equity graph allows us to explore and dissect ranges, which ultimately can be used to help us gain an understanding of how the solver is constructing its EV maximizing strategies.